nobody's in favor of a dirty environment. Nobody's in favor of climate change. So everybody cares in Canada, pretty high level of um, acceptance of climate science, certainly compared to the US. Uh, but not everybody's paying attention all of the time. And also a lot of people have um, conflicting objectives. They care about the planet, but they want to get to work conveniently in a car. Um, so I think for politicians, they have lots of reasons to be skeptical of polls that say everybody wants action on climate change because as soon as they do something that increases prices, they're worried that they will provoke a backlash. So welcome everyone to the EcoPolitics podcast. This podcast series tackles some of the big questions in the field of environmental politics for university students in Canada. And I'm Ryan katz from the University of Ottawa, and my co-host for the show is Peter Andre from Carleton University, although he is not joining us for today's chat. Um, and in, in this episode, I'll be talking with Dr. Catherine Harrison, a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia, and Dr. Andrea Olive, an associate professor and chair of political science at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. And we're going to be talking about federalism and how that influences environmental policy in Canada, and also a related discussion on carbon pricing in the Canadian Federation. Um, so this is not necessarily the easiest topic at the moment, uh, because there's so much variation and change across Canada, uh, both from one province to the next and from one year to the next in terms of how provincial governments have gotten along, how they've collaborated, how they fought with each other, uh, and also how they've, um, they've uh, chosen to tackle carbon pricing in their own way. Uh, but for that reason, we're quite lucky uh, on this episode to have Catherine and Andrea help us break it down. Uh, they are amongst Canada's leading experts working in this area, having researched and published uh, on this extensively and having recently collaborated on a project looking at carbon pricing across uh, the Canadian Federation, which uh, we'll be sure to link up to on our podcast website. Um, so before launching into the big questions, how, how are you guys doing? I'll start with you, Catherine. How are you holding up during the great pandemic summer of 2020? <laughs> well, you know, I, I remind myself of that I'm actually very lucky, um, you know, have secure jobs, secure housing, and try to cut myself slack for, you know, not getting nearly as much done as I intended. And I don't even have like baking sourdough or kids at home to, to explain it. I just watch too much news on TV. <laughs> there you go. Well, I'm feeling pretty lucky too. And I, I was chatting with Andrea earlier and it sounded like she's also feeling pretty fortunate. So is, is that the case? Where, what are you doing, Andrea? I am feeling extremely lucky. I um, So while I am a professor at UTM, I have maintained a house in Saskatchewan. My husband and I have a summer home here on a small lake. So we have really just been able to enjoy, you know, Saskatchewan has so few cases. It went into like reopening very quickly. Um, and it just feels like a parallel universe when I talk to my colleagues at the University of Toronto. Um, so I do, I feel extraordinarily lucky to be able to, to spend my summer here, uh, especially this summer. Right. And, and so I guess in that sense, we're kind of based across the country, although um, maybe not somewhere from out east, but that's maybe a good, uh, good place to be in terms of tackling our first uh, substantive question, which looks at how, um, you know, different provinces are tackling uh, environmental policy uh, in Canada. So um, we have a pretty complicated structure here, a constitutional structure, a division of powers and responsibilities between the provinces and the federal government. Uh, and, you know, we know there are some areas of shared jurisdiction and also some areas where, you know, one or the other is primarily in charge. And things get more complicated when we factor in regional politics and a whole array of political parties across the political spectrum. And we have premiers that sometimes see eye to eye with each other and sometimes they totally don't get along <laughs> with the prime minister. And so I guess my first question, and I guess it is a big one, and starting with Catherine, because uh, you, you've looked at this for, for um, quite some time, 
is, you know, what do you think are some of the ways that this complex constitutional structure shapes or maybe constrains and limits how environmental challenges get tackled in Canada, uh, particularly in, compared to other types of uh, constitutional structures? Oh, that it is a big question. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think of federalism as a really complicated machine and mm-hmm. it's got all kinds of different levers. And in the Canadian case, it's got 11 different steering wheels, <laughs> 10 provinces in the federal government. And that can be great if they all want to go in the same direction. Um, so you've got, you know, some provinces steering in the areas that they know best and the feds and they're all going in the same direction. If that's not the case, um, it's it's a lot more complicated and all bets are off. So I think sometimes federalism can be very positive for environmental protection and sometimes very negative. And just to give a few examples of different dynamics from climate change policy, which I know we'll talk about more. Um, some of the good news is that you can have provinces that are willing to lead, that are willing to stick their necks out and take action um, when no one else is. And so we saw Ontario phase out coal-fired power um, fairly early. And that's still, I think, the single measure that's had the biggest impact. Um, you see with 10 provinces, you've got more possibilities for innovation. So we've seen innovative policies emerge like low carbon fuel standards actually initially came from um, U.S. federalism, but migrated to Canada uh, through B.C., um, revenue neutral carbon taxes, and then sometimes diffusion of those really good ideas to other provinces and then to the federal government. So Ontario's coal phase out is now national. Carbon pricing is now national. Um, But on the other hand, some of the negative things are um, Canada is a big country and and there's such different Hmm. economies in different provinces and the more carbon intensive provinces aren't always following the leaders. They don't want to follow the leaders. They mm-hmm. want to develop their fossil fuel resources. Um, so, and we also on top of that have this norm. Now it's not a constitutional requirement. It's a norm in the Canadian Federation of seeking consensus, federal mm-hmm. provincial consensus. And what that's meant is that on many occasions, um, provinces that are most resistant to taking action on climate change have vetoed national or you know, Canada-wide action. So for, um, I don't know, at least 15 years, the province of Alberta blocked the idea of a national emissions trading program. For a long time, the province of Ontario, which used to rely even more on auto manufacturing, vetoed tighter um, tailpipe standards for motor vehicles. Hmm. So, and sometimes they just all fight with each other, which is what they're doing with uh, carbon taxes. And I'm sure we'll talk lots more yeah. about that. So a mixed bag. Right. But w- would you say that there's something about the, the structure that kind of slows down environmental, you know, the, the pro- slows down action or progress on environment in Canada specifically, just because of that sort of layer of complexity? Um, you know, you, you kind of implied we need all the stars to align. And there, there have been moments where that seemed to be the case. Maybe, you know, 2016 seemed to be a, a moment when the premiers and, and, and the uh, prime minister got together and and came up with this pan-Canadian framework, but then it kind of fell apart to a, you know, to a certain extent um, when new provincial governments uh, came to power. And so I guess I wonder, like, is, is based on, on international comparisons, like, is this something that we just have to live with, that this is a, you know, something that really holds back and slows down action? Or is this maybe seen in a positive light that, that there's, you know, these checks and balances on on ensuring that we're not, um, you know, going too quickly down a particular path? I would say on balance, federalism has been a hindrance uh, Mm. to Canada's response to climate change and lots of other environmental issues too. Um, I, you know, it's, it's not only a hindrance. There have been these positive moments. um, And I think the fact that Canada has um, Canada wide carbon pricing is one of those positive things. Um, But in general, federalism has slowed us down. And when we have moved forward, it's often been with some kind of ugly um, 
political deals. So approval of a pipeline in exchange for carbon pricing, um, you know, expanding Canada's fossil fuel exports in exchange for uh, a fairly modest carbon price on our own emissions. So, yeah, I think that federalism has been a problem. And that's because of the diversity of the federation and the, um, you know, provinces like Saskatchewan and Alberta in per capita terms, the carbon emissions per person would be the highest in the world if mm-hmm. they were countries. On the other hand, we've got Quebec, which has hydropower, has relied a lot on natural gas and would be kind of equivalent to a Western European rel- relatively low carbon intensity industrialized country. Mm-hmm. Right. So it seems like there's a there's a lot of wheeling and dealing that happens has to happen. Uh, and, and maybe there are some forms of politics that can kind of encourage that process um, more effectively sure. than, than others. Um, maybe that's a, a good way to uh, opportunity to turn to a question I have for Andrea, uh, because, Andrea, you've written quite a bit about um, the environmental policy process in Canada as part of your, your book. And, you know, just like the federalist structure that the the process of forming environmental policy in Canada is quite multifaceted, it's quite complex, and it, it's, you know, it's not just a bunch of policymakers in the capital making the rules. Um, so I guess one of the things I wanted to, to get you to talk about for students is, you know, what are some of the other actors um, that are shaping the environmental policy process in Canada that students should be aware of and you know how do they how do they do that how do they they play a role in shaping the development of environmental policy how do they get their foot in the door um, do some <laughs> groups have more power than others do some actors uh, know how to make this work okay that that's a great question um Although I will just say that your federalism question is always the final exam question in my environmental <laughs> policy course. Um, so I love that question too. And I like that I didn't have to answer it. So they don't know, like, what would I have said? Um, for the, um, yeah, so who who's shaping um, public policy? So we generally think, sure, it's the executive branch, right? It's the prime minister and the cabinet primarily in charge, but actually that's, that's not, that's not the whole story, right? There are all these other actors that you sort of allude to. And I mean, just to name a couple, it would be sort of like indigenous peoples um, and other citizens, business and industry can be huge, sometimes too huge. NGOs, political parties, um, municipal governments can be like in in the climate world, that's a really big actor. And then of course, the courts um, would also play a really significant role. I always like to have students focus on and sort of become a, more aware of their own role. I mean, as citizens, as as voters or as people who can, you know, tweet to their members of parliament or something, but actually also as their role as consumers. And I think that one is often overlooked. And that's like all day, every day, we make decisions about where to spend our money. And it can be, you know, in the cafeteria at lunch and like whatever you're deciding to buy in a way it's like voting for that product would I want more of this do I support more of this because that's essentially what you're signaling and so if you think about it that way I think it might shift some of the decisions that you're trying to make and that can have like huge outcomes for public policy Hmm. yeah well I mean that opens up a whole a uh, number of questions, <laughs> follow-up questions. I mean, and yeah, you mentioned some some groups that uh, hadn't um, occurred to me just in jotting things down uh, beforehand, you know, in terms of municipal governments uh, and the courts in particular, um, which which maybe sometimes slows things down in terms of the policymaking process. Um, do you think that some groups might have more <laughs> more access to the political process. I'm thinking here on reports we've seen in recent years about, uh, you know, the level of lobbying access that certain groups, in particular, uh, you know, the, the oil and gas industry has had in Ottawa and in, in uh, some provincial governments as well. Um, is, is, do you see that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I would say absolutely. Um, I mean, I think some actors have more influence than others, and it will depend on the issue when it's something like climate change. I, I would say without a doubt, industry has had too big of a role. 
And then it's even just simple things like, um, you know, contributions to electoral campaigns and how much that can vary in a, in a federal system, you know, like um, by province, because province will set its own sort of um, campaign contribution regulations. And, and that opens the door for all kinds of influence in different ways. And, and it can be uh, not always the most democratic Um, way to go about influencing public policy that's allowing money to speak right and and to speak louder than citizens right and and, you know on the flip side of that we have seen um a growing climate movement and to a certain extent a student driven or student or youth-led climate movement in this country uh wasn't too long ago when Greta Thunberg was was visiting and uh you know there were you know, some of the largest, um, man, you know, demonstrations and protests that we've seen in this country and students across the country marching. Do these groups really have power? Uh, or maybe we can contextualize, like, what, what kind of power do they have in the process? And maybe, Catherine, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn that to you. Like, when you see these groups coming together on the street, um, does that seem like a like a, a way of uh, an effective way of um, influencing the political process? I think it can be, and I was I was tremendously encouraged by um, the youth led protest that we saw in Canada last year, um, and I think the moments when broad public attention has really had the most impact is when the environment in general or climate in particular have been top of mind. They have been the it's been the issue that's been motivating a significant share of the electorate. And I think we saw that um, in the fall of 2019. Uh, it coincided with an election, Thunberg's visit, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Canadians in the street, um, I think, makes politicians sit up and take notice and think maybe this really is going to influence their vote mm-hmm. um, more than other things. And I think also just the youth movement has been such a powerful, they've been such a powerful voice for the injustice of climate change and the responsibility of, Mm. you know, my generation to do better. And, um, you know, it's just, it's been very powerful. And honestly, it's, it feels good to be (laughs) in the street with other people. And I think that's something we uh, underestimate that the the spillover benefits for people of going out in the street with their kids, with their neighbors, um, and realizing how powerful it feels as a citizen. So, so maybe I'll, I'll run that, uh, answer by Andrea and see, see if she, uh, agrees. I mean, do do you see the youth climate movement in Canada having that, that degree of power in terms of offering a hopeful movement, but also just signaling to you know political leaders and we live in a democracy that you know this is an uh, an issue that is important to Canadians and that they better take notice for sure i think the spillover effects are actually huge i think not just like inspiring people who are trying to make a difference to keep going and that you know people do believe in what it is we're trying to accomplish Um, I think that's really important, but even just like conversations that, you know, these young people are having with their parents and just like that, that knowledge gain and information flow is, I think, really huge. And like, you know, even if the impact isn't immediate, I, I'm, I always think politicians and the system maybe discounts, uh, future voters, um, but but that's meaningful and and I do think it's important. I think it's really important. And I don't know I, I don't know how you feel about me like quoting Taylor Swift on your podcast, but like only the young can run, right? Like I mean that's that's it. And I, and I do like getting young people involved in politics and and really with their feet and going out there like Oh, that's huge. That's huge. And so absolutely, I I do. And I I don't know if it's like, we can't just point and say, well, you know, Saskatchewan still doesn't have a carbon tax, so it didn't work. I mean, it's it's not that simple, right? Um, I don't think we should be looking for a quick um, policy flip, you know, just based on on some 
climate marches. Um, mm. But that's not to say that the climate marches didn't matter or that they weren't important. I think that's mm. just the wrong metric. Well, that maybe there's a, an opportunity there to, to flip that back into a, a question about regionalism. Um, you know, we, we, we all teach young Canadians and, and sometimes older Canadians, but usually <laughs> most of our students are young Canadians and um, it, they do seem to be on the whole very aware of climate change. They, uh, you know, this is an issue they're going to be dealing with for the rest of their lives and, and they're passionate about it. Um, in, and I was intrigued to see large climate marches in places like Calgary, in Edmonton uh, and, and out West as well. So um, to go back to you, Andrea, like, do you, do you see the youth movement changing the regional politics that we have, particularly around energy? And, uh, you know, I, 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 I for one, see maybe a, a little bit of a generational contact, uh, conflict emerging in Alberta, <laughs> um, in the, in the near term, in terms of, you know, a, a generation that is, you know, kind of fed up with, with the way things are, are going in terms of climate politics. And then another generation that has benefited from, you know, a, a strong economy and, and jobs in a particular industry. So. There is a large, I think, uh, generational difference. And I can't speak to uh, many provinces, but we did survey data in Saskatchewan uh, back in February, so pre-COVID, um, asking people about like a transition off oil and gas. And we haven't released the data yet, but we plan to soon. I was with Emily Eaton at the University of Regina and Randy Besco at the University of Toronto Mississauga. And like when you break it down by age, it's interesting because young people feel really differently um, than people like over the age of 45 or over the age of 40. There is a real divide there. And um a, a real like, you know, concern for climate change is bigger, but also just support for solar energy and wind energy and for transitioning completely off fossil fuel production um, as well as consumption. And and we see those numbers like general, like, you know, age is what matters a lot of the time and sometimes even more than political party. So that's really fascinating. Yeah, it'll be interesting to, to see how that uh, changes things in the future, particularly in terms of, you know, Canadian regional politics uh, and also, you know, provincial politics uh, itself in, in provinces like Alberta uh, and Saskatchewan. So I'm thinking we should turn now to the, the big uh, theme here about carbon pricing in the Canadian Federation. Um, and maybe just to start off by taking a step back and just talking about, you know, just working out for students, uh, what exactly is happening out there in terms of this federally mandated price on carbon, uh, a so-called carbon tax, uh, as it's uh, often referred to. So this is part of the pan-Canadian framework for clean growth and climate change. But we also have some provinces that have said, no, we don't want a carbon tax. Uh, so maybe I'll turn this to Catherine to try and explain this a little bit for us. How is it that we have different means of pricing carbon in different places across Canada? Oh, it's a, it's a bit of a complicated story of how we got here. As I mentioned, sometimes some provinces lead and we saw a few provinces that were leading um, going into the 2015 election. BC had adopted um, a revenue neutral carbon tax in 2008. Quebec had joined with California in an emissions trading scheme. Ontario had just joined that. Um, I guess they were planning to join that emissions trading scheme. They did so briefly in, I think, 2018. And um, Alberta had kind of this two-step process where they had applied um, a price to uh, large oil sector um, emissions, but then uh, a, an NDP government elected in Alberta had uh, expanded that program and also created a carbon tax on households. So we had these four big provinces, which account for most of the Canadian population that already had or were about to um, have carbon pricing. And then the federal liberals going into that election announced a kind of two-part policy. They promised that they would put a price on carbon, 
And that was uh, the centerpiece of their climate action plan. Um, but they also said they would do it in partnership with the provinces. So mm. they could have just said, we're going to do it Canada wide, but they said, we're going to build on the actions of provinces. And I think that that was not a constitutional decision. It was a political decision mm. that it meant that the idea of a national carbon price was less threatening to people in some regions that might have been worried about what the impact might be on their economy. And of course, it was facilitated by not giving a lot of specifics, what the price would be, who it would apply to, whether there would be a backstop. And then initially, the federal government, the new federal government, the liberals that were elected were getting along pretty well with the provinces by um, late, I think, December 2017, the federal government and all provinces but Saskatchewan agreed to the pan-Canadian framework, which is a plan with a lot of different parts, some of them to be undertaken by the provinces, some by the federal government. The key part of that was that each province would undertake carbon pricing itself, but if they didn't, the federal government would step in. Hmm. So things were looking pretty good until a great unraveling in 2018. There was a change in government in Ontario, um, and the uh, new conservative government uh, withdrew from the emissions trading scheme that the Liberals had taken Ontario into. Um, new Brunswick, New Brunswick's proposed carbon pricing scheme was rejected by the federal government. There was a change. Um, there was an election in Alberta. There was um, a plan in Manitoba that also didn't pass muster, and they withdrew. So suddenly the federal government had to act on its commitment, which was to establish um, a tax and dividend scheme in any province that didn't meet the federal government's benchmark, as it's called, which was you had to have similar coverage to BC's carbon tax, and you had to start with a relatively low carbon price moving up to $50 per ton by 2022, or have an emissions trading scheme that would deliver equivalent reductions as would have been achieved by a carbon tax. Now that's a complicated thing to enforce, mm -hmm. um, which we can get into, but what ended up happening is we had some provinces that continued on their way. BC had its carbon tax, Quebec had emissions trading scheme. A few others adopted their own carbon taxes, um, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, um, Nova Scotia put in place a bit of an unusual emissions trading scheme. And then it, the federal government imposed a federal carbon tax in five provinces. Since then, a couple of others have um, adopted their own carbon taxes and the feds have withdrawn. That's happened in New Brunswick. And I think it may have happened this month in Manitoba as well. So we've got a real patchwork of provincial carbon taxes, um, federal carbon tax, and uh, two very different emissions trading schemes at the provincial level. Right. Well, yeah, pat patchwork indeed. But maybe, maybe, and that's a fantastic um, re recap of that complex that that patchwork and that complexity across the country. Can can you also um, briefly? differentiate for us the difference between a carbon tax and a carbon cap and trade system, or you would refer to it as an emissions trading scheme. It seems like these are the two main forms of carbon pricing. Are there others? What What is the, the gist of the logic of how those are intended to actually address climate change? For sure. Um, so I think one thing I would say at the outset is that any actions that we take that are going to be meaningful to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions will have a, an implicit carbon price. So it's just a question of how high hmm. that price is and how visible it is. So two forms of explicit um, and intentional carbon pricing are indeed um, cap and trade or emissions trading and a carbon tax. What a carbon tax does is it specifies the price and then consumers and industry respond to that price signal by conserving energy, by switching to cleaner um, fuels, by innovating and coming up with technologies to reduce emissions. So the higher the price, the more they will do, but there's uncertainty about what the resulting emissions will be at any given, um, given price. Mm 
The alternative approach is to specify the emissions, put a cap on emissions and allocate those emissions by different means. Sometimes they're just handed out as a fraction of historical emissions to um, existing polluters. Sometimes they're auctioned off, but you know what the emissions are going to be, but you don't know what the resulting price would be. So people get their emissions allocation and then they're allowed to buy and sell them. Um, in competitive markets, the two are equivalent, but the uncertainty is different. With a price, you're not initially sure what the emissions will be. With a cap and trade scheme, you're not initially sure what the price will be. And that's what makes it hard hmm. to reconcile the two and to say it's up to provinces to choose whichever approach they hmm. want. But we want them to be equivalent is that um, – you could do that if you had perfect information about every polluter's control costs um, and emissions, but we don't. And so it's a bit challenging to figure out how to make the two equivalent. Hmm. And, and then just one quick follow up before I turn uh, back to Andrea. Um, <laughs> is the carbon tax actually working? And, and maybe we have some uh, contradictory evidence coming out of the case of British Columbia. Um, and I'm curious to ask you because you're, you're familiar with this, but you know, did the, t you know, it's, it's one thing to say that, that, um, the tax reduced emissions on a per capita basis. Did it actually reduce the province's emissions in, a, in net terms? And I, from what I understand, the answer to the latter question is, is no, it didn't. That emissions actually did increase overall, but but that the emissions per capita did decrease. And so the, it did have that influencing pressure on, you know, on, on uh, commercial activity and consumer activity. Um, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that was that was what I had uh, understood. But do you do you think that a carbon tax in theory works? And is it working in practice in the Canadian context? Um, I think it works. In practice, in theory, yes, and also we've got a growing number of studies that it works in practice. I do think we have tended to establish, because carbon taxes are so controversial, um, citizens don't like taxes of any sort, and political parties, opposition parties have taken advantage of that to raise a lot of questions. The implication has been that we have established a higher bar for whether carbon taxes work than regulations. So for instance, we regulate emissions from motor vehicles. Um, those regulations have worked to reduce emissions from individual motor vehicles, but historically the number of cars on the road have increased and emissions from motor vehicles for a period of a couple of decades were going up. People don't say regulation doesn't work. What they say is we need stricter measures. And I think there's a similar thing going on with carbon taxes. Um, the BC carbon tax, because it was adopted in 2008 and because it was a um, it was a textbook example of a carbon tax, it applied the same price to all sources. Um, there weren't a lot of uh, special carve outs for powerful industries that we've seen in other sectors. Um, it made it an easy one for economists to study. And we now have a growing number of peer reviewed studies that have found that the BC carbon tax reduced emissions below what they would have been. They encouraged people to buy cleaner vehicles. They consumed less home heating fuels than they would have otherwise. They consumed less gasoline than they would have otherwise. And it had apparently a small positive effect on the economy rather than a negative one. So we know that emissions were lower than they would have been otherwise but the price, we also know that the price was not high enough to drive emissions down to what's needed to address climate change. And that's true with lots of regulations as well. It's a tool that can work. It's economically effective, but it's not going to work. If we're not going to achieve our goals, even for the 2030 Paris Agreement target, let alone net zero at $50 per tonne. If we do it by regulation, that can work too, but it will cost us more than $50 per month. Hmm. Right. So that, that aspect of, you know, how much does it, it's, it's much harder to see the cost. And when, it, when you're talking about it in the, in the form of a regulation or, or even the, the cost of an unregulated untaxed uh, system in terms of the cost of climate 
change. Um, maybe I can, because you, you know, you were talking about the political, uh, you know, challenges to, to carbon taxes. Um, the idea that there are these political lightning rods, um, and this along with another aspect of the carbon tax, uh, it being the, the, the federal, uh, federally mandated carbon tax, which I, I believe is revenue neutral. Those two facets seem to be um, points of contention for some of our colleagues in the field. And so if I can turn it over to, to Andrea, is a climate tax enough? What kinds of other things do we need to be thinking about or do we need to be um, thinking about other types of tools, uh, to use the word that, that, that Catherine used, in, to tackle climate change? Yeah, so I mean, the Pan-Canadian framework actually is filled with a whole bunch of other things. And all we sort of ever talk about is the carbon tax. Um, and you see even, um, even the, like, so carbon tax is a wedge issue. So there's, there's no doubt about it. And some of us try and use the language of price on carbon um, as though that makes it somehow different or that, I guess, signals both a carbon tax and cap and trade. Um, so it's a catch all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the word tax, people are, are not keen on that. Um, they just don't want to pay more for anything. They don't want to be taxed. But then I think the other thing is, um, and so it's directly tied to this revenue neutral thing. So if people don't want to be be taxed, then isn't the answer to just give them the money back. And then this like leaves people with their heads spinning, like, then why are you taxing them in the first place if you're just going to give them the money back? It sounds insane. Um, and then it's also, I think, the other sort of layer to that is um, – the distribution of wealth across the provinces or moving wealth from the West to uh, the federal government or perceptions that that might be happening and a lot of sort of animosity from people in the West um, being suspicious of how the federal government might be using any of the revenue that would be um, gained from, um, from a price on carbon across the provinces. Um, meaning just simply that, you know, it wouldn't be in the best interest maybe of Saskatchewan to allow, um, you know, the Trudeau government the ability to then use that money however it wants. Um, and so I, there, that sort of speaks to a mistrust and, a, and I don't want to be super cynical um, on your podcast, but that's sort of at times the reality of the situation. Mm. Um, and so I do think there's a ton of room to talk about other issues that are not that are directly related to climate change, but are not maybe um, as much of a lightning rod. Um, I mean, I still think con conservation is a discussion worth having. So just using less hmm. is something that like we don't tend to talk a lot about. Hmm. Um, but just using less energy, I think, is is a is a conversation that's still worthwhile. And maybe that seems silly in the grand scheme of things. Um, but but I do think that that message still needs to be out there. And then there's, um, you know, alternative energy. If you look at a place like North Dakota, and I might be the only person in the world who talks about North Dakota on a regular <laughs> basis, but um, because nobody looks at North Dakota. But, but the interesting thing about them is they've decided to just become an energy superpower. Hmm. And so they're going to produce oil, but they're also going to produce wind and they're going to produce a ton of wind. They're going to be one of the largest wind producers in the United States. And it's that discussion is not about climate change. They're hmm. not talking about doing wind energy for climate change, for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, those are great spillover effects. And I'm sure that makes environmentalists happy, but that's not why North Dakota is doing it, or that's at least not how, how they're talking about it. And so that's one, I, I think that's a pathway forward for Saskatchewan, for the new Democratic Party here, to stop talking about the carbon tax and to st instead start talking about all of our solar energy, all of our wind energy, and really get like embracing that. Um, and maybe that's never going to be enough either, but all of these little things combined might lead us somewhere hmm. worthwhile. So so one of the questions I was going to ask was who gets it right when it comes to carbon pricing? And I'm defining who broadly there, whether it's a province that's getting it right or maybe a particular uh, researcher or writer uh, or analyst. Um and you had outlined, you know, North Dakota as a jurisdiction that's maybe having some some uh, important discussions, not so much about 
how do we tax and price carbon, but about, you know, energy, create, just creating lots of energy, becoming an energy uh, superpower. And also uh, identified people who are asking questions about cons- consumption, conservation, how do we consume less? Um, Catherine, when you are asked, you know, who gets it right, what jurisdictions or, or people or uh, writers uh, come to mind in terms of getting this, this discussion about how to price carbon effectively or how to reduce uh, emissions effectively? Um, you know, it's funny because Canadians have been bathing in this toxic debate about our carbon tax for, you know, well, for years, but certainly uh, since 2018. And the rest of the world loves it and is so excited about what Canada is doing, because I think there's a difference between, unfortunately, good policy and good politics. I think mm. um, the federal government's tax and dividend program is well designed. It applies broadly. Um I'm a fan of giving the money back, although I think it would have been better if they sent quarterly checks rather than having a much less visible um, tax credit in the annual tax rebate. Um, It's not the only thing. I think it's really important that, I mean, we're in such an emergency situation now that we need to throw a lot of things at this issue. So it needs to be complemented by other policy tools. And I think um, Canada's has done a lot of that. So, you know, I think the tax and dividend scheme is a really good one. I think we can't kid ourselves that um, in two respects um, that it's limited. One of them is that shifting from um, clean, from dirty energy to clean energy alone is not going to solve Canada's challenge Hmm. um, because we need something else to export. Um, a lot of our emissions, but also a lot of our economy are associated with producing fossil fuels that we send somewhere else and that get burned somewhere else. So just switching our own energy consumption from fossil fuels to wind and hydro, even to natural gas, isn't going to replace the hole in our economy if right. fossil fuels are phased out. And the other aspect of it, and then this is really embedded um, in Canada's carbon pricing scheme is that because the fossil fuels that we export get burned somewhere else, they're not our responsibility under the Paris Agreement. So we've got a great carbon pricing scheme, but it was predicated on expanding production of um, bitumen from the tar sands for export via a new pipeline. Hmm. So um, there's definitely... Um, I think a negative underside to that policy. So, so you used in there the word emergency, and and I think um, Andrea would agree we we are facing a climate emergency, um, and we know also that Canada's record on climate action is perhaps uh, not as good as it could be. But that said, that's an understatement. It's an understatement of the year, but uh, but we also have some indication that you know Canada has a, a strong reputation, at least in in word, and that things uh, you know that the Pan Canadian framework in particular um, was a jolt in the arm, so to speak, of of t- tackling this issue more wholeheartedly, more more seriously than perhaps our country has done. This country has done in the past. So my final question to you both, um, starting with Andrea, is, you know, are you hopeful about the future? Are you hopeful about uh, in Canada's ability to turn things around, to genuinely, um, you know, peak in terms of annual emissions and to start to see a reduction of, um, of greenhouse gases in the near term? Yeah, I so yes, I think I'm just inclined to be hopeful um, in general. And in part, it's from things like the youth movement and and just increased attention. I mean, arguably happening way too slowly, but it is happening. I get I mean, we've we're using the word emergency and and that is um, it can be really frustrating. You know, normally when there's an emergency, or when, like when there's a fire, you 
are telling people that they need to run and take cover and those that can need to grab buckets and start working on putting it out. Right. Mm. And, and we're not, I mean, we're using the word, but that's not actually what people are doing. Right. And so I, I feel like it leads to sort of that, that issue fatigue, like, Oh, I've been hearing about this emergency for the last 15 years. Right. Like it's, it's not an emergency. And, and, and I'm starting to feel that way um, about biodiversity too. Right. We've been talking about biodiversity loss as being an emergency uh, as well. And one directly related to climate change. And so it can feel exhausting um, and it can feel like nothing's ever changing, but I mean, I think even listening to Catherine talk about everything that's happened um, with with the Pan Canadian framework and everything, you know, dating back to uh, BC's 2008. Um, yes, it's been 12 years and it's not been enough, but but it can happen. Um, and when when Trudeau's government was first elected, it happened kind of quickly with the Pan Canadian framework. I mean, one of the the geniuses or great I don't know travesties of federalism is that the federal government is the one who signs international treaties, and then the provinces are the ones who are required to actually implement the steps necessary to get us there. And so the federal government can keep showing up and you know at these UN summits and keep agreeing to things, and then come back and say to the province says, look, I made this promise, we have to do it. And, and that's an interesting way to govern, right? Um, and and maybe, maybe a frustrating one for students of, of Canadian federalism, but that's, mm. that's, the, way it, that's the way it goes. Um, the problem, I think, and I, and I don't want to talk about this, but has <laughs> also been with Donald Trump's government and with what's happened in the United States. And I feel like there's been a lot of momentum lost. I think if, if, Hillary Clinton would have won the election, I think things would have looked very different. I think Trudeau and and Clinton um, would have set North America down a different path. Um, And and that's, you know, I don't want to drag that out too far, but but I do think the influence of the United States has been huge um, and and in a very negative way. And so it's been difficult for Canada to keep focused and keep doing what we're doing and pretending like it matters when the United States has been so reluctant and not just reluctant, but like absolutely like dead weight dragging the world back. Um, And that's the really, really frustrating part to me. And there's not like, there's not a lot that Canada can do uh, about that. Hmm. Well, well, we'll save some tough questions for, for the U.S. context and, and Trump um, for our discussion with Matt and Stephen, which is coming up in a few weeks. But, um, but thank you for that. And, and uh, Catherine, do you feel hopeful when you're looking at the near-term future? I'm a mixed bag on that one. Um, you know, there's, I draw a distinction between optimism and hope, and it, it's not original. Um, uh, Rebecca Solnit is an American writer who's written a lot about hope in a dark time. Um, optimism is sort of what do you think will happen? Um, you know, do I think good things are happening or not? And hope is what could happen. Um, I think as a scholar, am I optimistic? Eh, you know, there's a lot of reasons for concern right now. I think if there's a challenge to the federal carbon pricing regime that the Supreme Court will hear. If that fails, I think the federal government could pivot and do other things, but we'll have lost a few more years, and that will be very troubling. I'm worried about the fact that we're still not having a serious conversation in this country about winding down our dependence on oil. We're still mm-hmm. planning to expand that even as we adopt um, some good climate policies. I'm concerned that unlike in many other countries, um, particularly in Western Europe, action, effective policies on climate change are still a partisan issue and we've still got one party that honestly in the federal election, the conservatives were saying a lot of things that were simply untrue um, and were pretending that their policy would achieve similar goals at lower costs and no academics were supporting that. In fact, many were speaking out against it. So we still have this partisan divide and I'm worried about COVID um, Mm. sort of taking the wind out of the sails of the youth climate movement. It's, it's redirected voters' attention. But that said, um, the reason 
I'm still hopeful. I choose to be hopeful that we could do better. And I think um, the fact that uh, Canada has adopted a number of really good policies, carbon pricing is one of them, but lots of other things are happening at the federal and provincial level. Um, the, they put in place the tools, they need to adjust the stringency of them, but that can be done. They've got the, the architecture in place. Canada kept going despite Donald Trump's withdrawal, and we haven't done that in the past we backed off. The Paris process um, is still proceeding. Canada is a constructive part of that. So um, I, I am still hopeful that we can do a whole lot better than we've done before. And in some respects, we're going in the right direction. There you go. So, so listening students take note that, uh, you know, we can still be hopeful while perhaps also <laughs> making sure that we're, we're critical and we're concerned about, you know, not, we're not uh, forgetting about the challenges ahead of us and not being uh, unrealistic about them. Um, but that, you know, the time is now, the time is now to, to act. So thank you guys so much. I think we should probably leave it there, but uh, I really appreciate your time and uh, both of you sharing your thoughts and your wisdom with us and uh, really happy that you, you know, you broke down these, these, complex issues like the federalist structure and the, the the crazy patchwork of carbon pricing in the Canadian Federation in a, in a digestible way. So that wraps up this episode of the EcoPolitics podcast. Uh, of course, don't forget to check out some of the other episodes in the series at our website, which is ecopoliticspodcast.ca. And thanks again for listening and we'll catch you next time.